station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, this is the International Space Station. I'm ready for the event. Lockview High School, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station. Station. Station, this is John Monroe, teacher at Lockview High School in Fall River, Nova Scotia. How do you hear us? John and uh, Lockview High School and everybody in Falls River, yes, I read you loud and clear from the space station. How's the weather up there? <laughs> the weather is uh, hot in the sun and cold in the shade and nice here inside. Well, we have some great questions for you, Mr. Commander Hatfield, so I'm going to send it over to David St. Jacques, and he'll get the questions going. Hey, Chris. Good to talk to you. David, bonjour. We have the pleasure to meet you. Merci. Chris, we have the winners of the Science Challenge with us here. Kendra Lemke and Meredith Faulkner in grade 10. And we were wondering if you had the possibility to do their experiment for us in space. I do. Uh, thank you for the invitation to do so. Um, for all of the people that can right across Canada in uh, thinking about a science experiment that we could do here on the space station, thank you for thinking about it. It's through original thought that inventions are made. Uh, and a special congratulations to uh, Kendra and Meredith for winning and for giving me the opportunity to demonstrate. And the question is, if you get a cloth dripping wet without gravity and you wring it out, What's going to happen? What will happen to a wrung out cloth? So, and I had to use equipment that was here on board the space station. We may have the coolest washcloths ever here on the space station. I'm going to show you. Here's one of our washcloths. And it's compacted. It's put down into this little tiny hockey puck so that uh, it saves space. But when you open up a hockey puck, and you pull out your washcloth. This is the one I'm going to use for the experiment today. Everything floats away, so I have to put it in my pocket. And so when you open up your hockey puck and turn it into a washcloth, it was compressed in a great big vise somewhere. OK, so here's my washcloth like a magic trick. And now I'm going to get this soaking wet, and then we're going to see what will happen when we wring it out. Meredith and Kendra suggested that I dip this in a bag, but bags don't hold water in space, so instead I filled a water bag. This has drinking water in it. And I'm going to uh, squirt a bunch of water into this washcloth. It's getting nice and wet. I want to make sure for the experiment that it's really soaking wet. OK, so I have a soaking wet washcloth here floating in front of me. And now I'm going to wring it out and see what happens. All 
I'll get up close so you can see here. Oh, there's one, there's one ball of water floating around. I'll put it on the washcloth. Okay, so here's a soaking wet washcloth. Get the microphone so you can hear me while I'm talking. And now let's, let's start wringing it out. It's really wet. It's becoming a tube of water. It looks very cool. The water's running up my hands a little bit. Hey, Tom, can you come grab me a towel, please? I got one on the wall. It's over here by Sevis. So I'd be on the other side of Sevis there, stuck on the wall. So the water is all over my hands, in fact. It rings out of the cloth into my hands. And if I let go of the cloth carefully, the water sort of has it stick to my hand. The surface tension of the water keeps it stuck to my hand. Thanks, Tom. Grab the microphone. Okay, so the uh, experiment worked beautifully. And the answer to the question is the water squeezes out of the cloth, and then because of the surface tension of the water, it, um, it actually runs along the surface of the cloth and then up into my hand, almost like you had jello on your hands or gel on your hand, and it'll just stay there. Wonderful moisturizer on my hands. And the cloth doesn't really unravel itself. It just stays there floating like a, uh, like a dog's chew toy, soaking wet. Great experiment, worked perfectly. Meredith and Kendra, congratulations, great idea. Thank you, Chris. I know everybody was thinking in their own mind, <laughs> ah, we see you better now. Thank you. Everybody here was thinking, what will happen to that water? And uh, who had predicted this? Raise your hands if you had predicted this. Ah, I see a couple of hands there. That's good. Well, science is like that. You think a benign experiment will just be an obvious result? No, no, it can be very surprising. So, very creative idea. Thank you. Chris, if you have a little bit of time, uh, we can ask you, uh, there's a couple of questions here people have. Maybe the first one will be uh, Meredith. Uh, hi, Chris, I'm Meredith. Uh, how has your perspective of humans changed since viewing the world from Earth to viewing the world from space? How has my perspective of humans changed? Uh, it's an interesting question, Meredith, because you really have time to reflect when you're so far from home. You know, there are six of us on board, and we are completely separate from the other six and a half billion of the rest of us. And so you feel that physical separation. But it, it may be surprising to you, but in fact, I feel closer to everyone, I think, as a result. When you, when you live in your house, in your street, in your town, in your province, in your country, you tend to identify those things almost like, like layers of a fortress around yourself. You know, I'm from this place, and, and, and all those things are barriers between you and everybody else. And even travel tends to break that down. But to be in a position where you can go around the world in 92 minutes and see every place over and over and over again, those barriers um, fade. And of course, I still see the strife and, and the stupid things we do, like what happened yesterday in Boston and, and then the suffering we have to put through, like the enormous earthquake in Iran today. Things still happen and some people still horribly misbehave. 
but the vast majority of people are good. And people are just trying to find joy and raise their children well and, and find grace in life. And for me up here, um, I found partway through the flight, I just feel like I refer to everybody as just us. It's all of us together in this. And, and so I think it's a perspective that some people get naturally and that some people will never get. But I know it's a perspective that having the chance to see the world the way I've been trying to show it through the pictures I've been sending back, it's a perspective that you definitely get um, when you live on board a space station. Thank you, Chris. Thank, thank you, Chris. Uh, this is a very moving answer. And uh, Kendra also has a question for you. I know you started your career in the military, so I would like to know how that helps you prepare for being an astronaut. Also, what does the term BSSM mean? Uh, uh, Canada has a lot of really good universities. Uh, some some world-class universities. Uh, David uh, attended one or two of them. I've been lucky enough to go to a couple. One of them is the Royal Military College of Canada, and it's a fine old school, started in 1876, has a lot of traditions. A lot of schools have a, co a college song, and there's a college chant, which is BS is Emma, TDV, who can stop old RMC? And, uh, and I know, I think someone in your family went to RMC as well. So it's just... It's a common chant that you'll hear at the university to build esprit de corps. Um, and you asked the question about whether the military was important in me becoming an astronaut. Uh, there aren't very many Canadian astronauts who were military. The majority were not. But the common thread of success is, number one, uh, an advanced education. And uh, the military gives that to a lot of, a lot of us. It, it did for me. I have um, went to three different universities. Um, and also uh, to be in good physical health. That's good for anybody's success, and uh, the military stresses that. But if you look at David Saint-Jacques there with you, he's obviously very well educated, speaks multiple languages, and is in superb physical shape. And then the third is the ability to make good decisions. And you can get that from all different walks of life. Uh, and not just decisions about trivial things, but decisions when consequences matter. And David uh, learned that as a doctor. Um, and of course, I learned that as a military officer, as a, as a fighter pilot defending Canada, intercepting uh, bombers just off the coast of Nova Scotia, and also as a test pilot, uh, learning to test airplanes. So, so yes, in my case, the military was a wonderful um, organization, not only in the defense of Canada, but for Canadian citizens as well, and in, in giving me a background that would allow me to command a spaceship. But it's not the only route, but in my case, it was a very good one. Thanks, Chris. Allie has a question for you. Hi, Chris. My name is Allie. I'm in grade 9, and my question is, how long does it take to orbit Earth? Ali, it depends how far away you are. If you think about the Earth orbiting the sun, it takes us 365 and a quarter days. 364 and a quarter days? Anyway, one year, uh, plus a leap year every four. And uh, so that's because we're, whatever, 93 million miles from the sun. The moon takes one month to go around the world because it's 400,000 kilometers away. But sort of like a ball on a string, on a long, long string, you can spin it fairly slowly, and the ball will stay up. But if it's a little short string, you have to spin it really fast, or the ball will fall down. Sort of the same idea in orbit. Because the moon's a long ways away, it goes around the world about once a month. But the space station is much closer, and we have to go, if, we have to go around the world every hour and a half. And our exact altitude here, about 400 kilometers, means we have to orbit the world every 92 minutes. If we were a little further away, we'd go around the world more slowly. If we were closer, we'd have to go around faster. And one last thing, there's one orbit in between the moon that takes a month. 
in the space station, which takes an hour and a half, there is an orbit where it takes exactly 24 hours to go around the world, if you think about it, right? One month, 90 minutes. There's some orbit, some distance, exactly 24 hours. So if you can orbit at exactly 24 hours around, that means you'll stay above the same place on the Earth because the Earth takes 24 hours to turn around. It's a really valuable orbit for a satellite because you can bounce your signal off it all day. And that's how I'm talking to you, in fact, off one of those satellites. But for us, 92 minutes once around, 16 times a day. Thank you, Chris. We've got, to, we've got time for one last question from Cody. Greetings from Earth, Mr. Hatfield. Uh, obviously, being in space, have the best uh, eye view of the globe. I was wondering, uh, what are the effects visible of our constant corporate pollutions and other things such as like chemtrails and such? Yeah, the, the question of um, what changes are people making to the world, and are they visible? Um, and the answer is yes. The places they're most visible is where the most people are, naturally. The biggest cities, uh, over the big cities in China, um, over a lot of India, and over Mexico City, and over California, over Los Angeles. Um, there's almost always sort of a, a gray smear over those cities just because of the, the cumulative uh, exhaust of millions of people living in one place. Uh, you also see it in our changes to the surface uh, where we've cut down all the trees or where we have um, rapidly changed what was natural. So the Aral Sea has dried up and Lake Chad has dried up and uh, the water level in the Great Lakes is dropping a little bit and you can see those things from space. But there's something else to remember. If you look at the world, it is huge and beautiful and ancient. And the world has been here for four and a half billion years. We've only been here for the blink of an eye. We tend to think we're really, really important. But we're only important when we look in the mirror. The world has endured some incredible cataclysmic things in the past. And we're definitely not always doing it good. But uh, there's a lot of the world that is still in pristine conditions. So we can do better. We need to do better. But don't despair. Uh, there's still a huge amount of resource in our planet. We just need to take better care of it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commander Hatfield. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. Uh, if you don't mind, give us a shout out on Twitter. I'm sure we're all following you on Twitter. All the pictures that you great are, are excellent. Thank you so much. And have a great journey back on May 13th. Do you want to talk more? Do you want me to say more? Oh. Thank you very much. And congratulations again to the winners. And Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Lockview High School Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.